please give a warm Georgia Tech welcome to our guest, Daryl Higginbotham. Good afternoon. Everything is better with music, right? So who knows what was playing when you came in? Blue Man Group, who said that? You get the first rubber duck of the day. Bingo. All right, guys. Well, my name is Daryl Higginbotham, and I, I am very uh, uh, honored to, to be asked to speak to you today. And, and I know that after a long day in class, and then you've got one more lecture to go to, that uh, the, the first thing on your mind is probably to get out of this lecture, go hit Domino's, get a pizza, Starbucks, get a coffee, and jump into your books. So I'm hoping here for the next 45 minutes or an hour, I can help share with you some of the things that that was influ influential to me uh, going through university and that, that really helped direct the, um, the way we ended up going as a business um, and personal things as well. But going, going at the, from the top, I have a, a small PowerPoint presentation here and, and the title is Looking Up From The Basement, Growing A Small Business. And I was asked to speak to Georgia Tech a few months ago with how my life story in, influenced the way I grew as, as a person. And uh, Bill Gunn uh, could not be here today, but I understand that, Terry, that they've got me signed up to speak to the group again uh, next spring, so I'm, I'm, I'm honored to do that as well. We have three companies, basically Higginbotham Associates, Marietta X-Ray, and Marietta NDT. So we're going to consolidate all of our operations as Marietta NDT starting next year. But starting at the beginning. All you touch and all you see is all your life will ever be. So, poet and lyricist? Pink Floyd, what album? Dark Side of the Moon. There you go. You get a rubber duck. You get a keychain rubber duck. So, everybody has that aha moment. Everybody has an aha moment. If you don't have that moment, you're going to live in the dark for the rest of your life. So for me, that awakening came when I was listening to Dark Side of the Moon. And I said, you know, if I just keep doing what I've done before, the only thing I'll have is what I have now. So what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? And for me, it was moving from Gainesville, Georgia, down to Marietta and going to Southern Tech, or now it's called Southern Polytechnic State University. And this photo was taken of me when we were moving into uh, the trailer that, that I purchased. I didn't want to rent an apartment, so we bought a trailer. So this was moving day. So I, I, uh, I hold this humble photo up for, for you guys to see. But I'm just nothing more than a North Georgia redneck that has done a little bit more than, than, than most of us. All right? Quick background. Born 1962, Paris, France, U.S. Army base. My father was in the service for 22 years. Uh, I have a special affinity for, for veterans. I, I really appreciate all of them for their service to our country. And we will hire a veteran in our office if there's a ver veteran capable and competent of doing what we need to do. My mother graduated young Harris, and she was a stay-home mom. And uh, I, I enjoyed going to school, riding my motorcycle, and doing all the normal things until, at age 13, my parents divorced. So here it is, wham. My mother, at the time, was 39 years old. Uh, me and my sister were the two dependents, and she ran a paper out to put food on the table. And it was a challenging time. It was, it was, uh, it was difficult to make ends meet, but I learned a lot of lessons from, from that challenging time. So the rest of the story. High school and the paper out years. I went to North Hall High School in Gainesville, Georgia, just, just north of the city of Gainesville, very rural school where my focus was two things. I was in band and I was in auto shop. That was why I was there. I was not on the college track. But going to high school, I mentioned to you, my mother ran the paper out. That gave me a, a instant understanding of customer service. In those days, the paper carriers would buy papers from the companies and then we would resell them to each individual customers. When I was 15 years old, my mother had a heart attack. And here I am, not old enough to drive, having to pick up the pace, ask a friend of mine who was 16 years old to run the paper out so I could leave high school at 1 o'clock every day and run the papers. And I did this for four months. So here I am, 15 years old, running a paper route, 
handing out invoices, collecting money, and paying the Gainesville Times. So it wasn't by choice. It was by default. I just absolutely had to do it. And if you didn't do it, you would go hungry. It was that simple. Well, my mother recovered. She, she, did, she did very well, and, and, and she did better and was able to take over the paper route uh, uh, a few months after we had to do it. But that instant shock into dealing with customers was really a, a, a key thing for me. So who do you want to be when you grow up? I mean, did all you guys get out of bed and say, I'm going to go to Georgia Tech? And by the way, let me get a show of hands. How many are undergraduate? Very good. How many of you are on a graduate program? Very good. How many of you are faculty and visiting guests? All right. Well, wel welcome, to, welcome to everyone. But who do you want to be when you grow up? Where and when are you going to have that aha moment? So for me, sharing my life story with you, in high school, I was going to be an auto mechanic. So from 1978 to 1981, I turned to wrenches, a place called F&M Imports. And I was very fortunate to have very good bosses, Fred Powell and Mark Bell. Fred Powell never went to college. Fred Powell was a very hands-on, detail-oriented technician. He was fantastic. He also taught me values of customer service and how to deal, deal with customers on a commercial basis. But Mark Bell went to University of Georgia. And I know we could bring up a whole discussion series on why UGA should not have an engineering curriculum, but I will not go there today. But Mark was a business major at University of Georgia and from the very beginning started sharing things with me like, Daryl, you know, buy a house as soon as you can, even if you have to eat bologna sandwiches. Buy a house as soon as you can. All right, Mark, that's good. Daryl, get to know your own personal bankers in your small towns. Get to know them one-on-one, because -on -one, you know you're going to need them one day. And all this time when he's telling me this and I'm 17, 18 years old, I'm going, yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, it sunk in the back of my head somehow. It really sunk in the back of my head. Uh, <clears throat> my uncle, Uncle Vertner, was a machinist at Lockheed, and he knew that I was going to go on the, uh, the, uh, the, mechanic tra the mechanic track, and he suggested that I consider something else. So one open house, he brought me down here to attend the open house at Lockheed Martin. And at the time, we were walking down the main B-1 building. They were building the large C-5B aircraft, and, and uh, there was another aha moment. Walking through this hangar, seeing these huge airplanes being built out of aluminum. This was just a cool thing. You mean, you can sit here and conceive and design and build this stuff? And it was like, wow. And I said, well, okay, well, maybe I want to learn how to be a machinist. So, 1981, the fall of 81, I enrolled into Lanier, Lanier Tech. Learn, learning how to use milling machines, lathes, making things out of metal. Machine and tool maker program was what it's called. That program is still in existence today, and they're putting out some wonderful students for industry. So when I graduated Lanier Tech, and it was, it was a pretty quick, it was a two-year program I got done in a year and a half. I just gravitated toward building things. It was a natural. And I went to work out in industry, and I was doing great. You know, I was making about maybe seven fifty dollars an hour, and it was really good money for back in the day, and, and I was doing good until a friend of mine came down and said, Daryl, you know, I'm going to Southern Tech. You need to check this out. You know, it's one thing to just make the machines out of metal, but wouldn't you love how to, to learn how to design the machines? And instead of just making them and welding them together, design them and conceive them yourself. And I said, you know, that's pretty good. I, I never really thought about that. But, you know, I wasn't on the college track, and, and you know, my, my math skills and science skills aren't that strong, so I'd have to go do some remedial work. And, and thank goodness at the time, Southern Poly would offered some remedial things that I needed to, to get where I needed to go. So I enrolled at Southern Poly in 1982. And when I came down here, you know, I was so nervous. Here I was, a country bumpkin. And I'm coming down to the big hot land to Marietta. So I go see the mechanical engineering technology department head, Ron Young. And I'm just nervous as can be. So I walked in. I still remember this day. I walked into the door. And as soon as I walked in, I saw sitting on his desk, he had a photograph of an Austin Healey Bug-Eye Sprite, a 1958 Bug-Eye Sprite. Well, I drove down there in my 1960 Bug-Eye Sprite. So we instantaneously connected, and we are still wonderful friends today. So it was, it was, there was a, just this kindred relationship that started automatically, and I said, hey, this feels pretty good. 
Well, it was a lot of hard work. You know, I started Southern Poly. Uh, I, I, I paid for school myself without any student loans. While I was going to university, I worked. I worked about 20 hours a week. And thank goodness, I worked for a, a very fine gentleman by the name of Bill Gunn. He was a Georgia Tech graduate. And at the time, he was president of Brinks Engineering. And Brinks was a neat company. It was part of the large Brinks Pittston Corporation. But our task was to build custom machines to handle coin, to pack coin in paper. Have you ever seen the coin that's wrapped in plastic? Well, that's an ATL 100 coin wrapping machine. And those machines are still built here in Marietta, Georgia. So I was able to work for Bill as a machinist making things for the ATL 100s while I was going to Southern Poly. Great, great, great time in my, in my life. I learned so, so much from Bill and, and working at that institution. But after graduation, I left Brinks and I went to work at Atlantic. And at that time, we started designing and building machines to handle radioactive materials for dosimetry calibration. So I was the first guy hired to design the machines, but I also had a machining skill set so I could go machine it. So when I went to work at Atlantic in uh, 1989, I started designing machines for the first time that were being sold commercially. And that was another aha moment. You mean I could dream up this machine, design it, build it, draw it out in CAD, get it made in the machine shop and fab shop, put it together and sell it. And that was like, wow. So while I was at Atlantic, we went from, from nothing to about $2 million in sales. Starting at Lantec, I told Bob Hearn, Hearn, the owner at the time, I said, Bob, I'll give you two years, but I do want to start my own business one day. I want to start Higginbotham Associates doing general automation. But I gave Atlantic two and a half years, and it was another, another great positive experience. Positive experiences. Positive experiences. College leadership development. Anyone in here in a fraternity or sorority? Fantastic. Yes, it is a social connection. It is a social group. But there are some leadership skills that you can earn or learn while you're, while you're going to university. So that's me right there. That's me. 1985, I was elected uh, the president of Sigma Nu. And, and there again, another aha moment that this group of young men thought that I was a strong enough person to be their leader. And we had a very successful year. You know, showing confidence in someone, there, there's no better way to pick them up and boost them and give them, give them self-confidence. <coughs> Developing sales skills. How many of you have ever sold donuts on the side of the road? You'll either make it or break it. You know, I still remember, get out, you, know, you say, get them hot, get them cold. These damn things have got to be sold. <laughs> you know? You know, Krispy Kreme donuts, the only ones with the hole in the middle. You know, there was just all kinds of things you did. But we, we had a, a great donut selling spot at an intersection, and we could always sell out our donuts. But that was my Subaru station wagon. We could put about 470 boxes in. So it was my job to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and come down here to Atlanta and pick up the donuts and uh, get ready to sell them. Working at Brinks. Brinks Engineering was, was another fantastic experience. Um, this is Bill Gunn here. Uh, Bill is teaching a management class. Terry, what's the title of his class he's teaching this spring? Authentic Leadership Development. Authentic Leadership Development. Uh, Bill is now retired from Brinks, but that is myself in the background, and this is when we built machine number 100, and it was a big milestone for us, so we, we took that photo. Uh, this gentleman over here is uh, Senator Bill Heath now from, uh, from Carroll County, and uh, he worked at Brinks as an electrical engineer, but he is now uh, serving in the, uh, in the uh, Georgia, Georgia House. Just for those technical guys, any mechanical people in here? All right, that's good. Well, let me just give you a 101 on coin wrapping. This is the ATL 100. Coins come up here in a drum, and this drum has an interior drum that spins. The coins are, are basically uh, counted out into these tubes, and then there's an indexing station here that rotates, dropping a set of coins in a, set, in a ball, and it goes through a big extruder where the plastic sucks around it, and then it cuts around the ball and it separates the ball from the plastic. It is the world's fastest coin wrapping machine. They'll do about 120 wraps a minute. Very weird looking machine, but it works, it works very, very well. When I was at Brinks, one of the things that Bill Gunn did is there again showed confidence in me. He entrusted in me the ability or, or, or the challenge to learn CAD programming. Now, believe it or not, believe it or not, back in the day, which was 1980. 1984, 
we bought one of the very first PC-based CAD systems. And it had computer-aided software for doing programming for CNC milling machines. So this AT, IBM AT with a 20 megabyte hard drive, my god, how could you ever use up 20 megabytes of memory, was uh, about $14,000. You know, it was, it was expensive, but uh, Bill sent me off to school to learn how to use the CAD, to use the CAM, and to program the CNC machine, and uh, we, we did very well bringing Brinks into some manufacturing uh, pretty early on in the game, automated manufacturing. So going to Southern Tech, working at Brinks, we kept hearing from the branches out there, man, we need a machine to open coins that was wrapped in paper that we've got to recount. So I asked Bill that if I could uh, uh, do as a senior design project to design a machine to do that. So this was the first machine I designed. We called it the wrapper snapper. And it was a pretty simple device. You put coins here that were wrapped in paper. It went down a chute. The coins got cut. And then it fell into the separator tray. And this was a vibratory tray. Coins went into this hopper. And the operators picked the paper up off of the top. So this was my first attempt at a machine. And we built it. And it worked. And it worked well. So I decided uh, that I was going to leave Brinks uh, after graduating and before going to work at Atlantic and sell these to industry. I was going to set the world on fire selling wrapper snappers. But what I did not realize is that Brinks was the only one that would use these machines. There was nobody else that needed this machine. So I did not truly understand the industry and the market. I made an assumption without doing my research. But without that machine there, I would have not started Higginbotham Associates. So, stand back here. Far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to tank rake with those spirits who neither enjoy much nor suffer much because they live in the gray twilight that knows not victory nor defeat. Well, when I told my lovely girlfriend that I was going to start my own business, and she was a Georgia Tech architecture major, uh, one night, 3 o'clock in the morning in the lab, she decided to do the rub on letters and do this little thing for me. And I still have it today in my office. But basically, you got to try. You just got to try. Don't be afraid of failure. Yes, you're going to have your failures, but you got to pick up and go at it again. But get out there and give it a try. So Higginbotham & Associates was started. Yes, I started the company in my basement in 1988. I bought a Bridgeport milling machine. That is my son, Brian, when I had the machine in my basement, and I started making parts for people. I would drive around industrial parks and look in the back doors, and I would look at people who were building stuff, and I would go up there and say, hey, has you got any parts I can make for you? And, you know, some of them shooed me out, but some of them said, yeah, come on in. One of those customers that said, yeah, you can help us make stuff was m USA. They still do a lot of work in Marietta where they do plastic injection molding. And we started making little $2 robot grippers for m back Oh, in my basement, 1988. And we still make those little dinky little grippers for them today. But I wasn't scared to go knock on doors and try to find customers. That's a key thing. Moving out of my basement, we moved into a very small warehouse right off the Marietta Square, uh, 700 square feet. It was a pretty big step. The gentleman that rented me this space said, uh, he said, tell you what you do, boy. He said, you come on in here and set up your machine shop. And when you start making some money, you can start paying me rent. I'm going, man, you know, what's he going to do? Is he going to turn around and just start hitting me with all this exorbitant money? But, but it was an opportunity, so it was a gamble. And I had a comfort level with Mr. Adcock. So we renovated this space. It was about 700 square feet. Moved the machines up there. Got my, got my machines up and going. Got a few more customers where I was making money. So I went to Mr. Adcock and I said, Hugh, I said, how much do I owe you now? He said, well, how about $200 a month? I said, what a deal. That included power and water. That was everything. So I had a break. I had a break by somebody who felt comfortable in me and said, okay, Daryl, come on over here. We think what you're doing is right. And you can start paying me a little money once you get on your feet and get up and going. So he, he was really a, a wonderful, wonderful start. Company history, 1991, Higginbotham Associates, primary focus was on manufacturing. This is when I started doing this full time. And I still remember going home to Becky at the time. We had a young child. I said, honey, I'm going to leave Atlantic. I'm going to start Higginbotham Associates. And of the tears, and how the baby going to get food, and how we're going to make the house payment, she said, okay. So uh, we, haven't made, we haven't missed a house payment yet, and the baby did not go hungry. So we're, we're, we're doing pretty well. As Higginbotham Associates, our primary focus was all kinds of general automation. But we started making custom machines to do x-ray and x-ray inspection. 
So in 1999, we decided that we would incorporate Marietta X-Ray. Pretty big step for us. We had two companies going in parallel, but our focus had really kind of shifted to people that needed to inspect things using X-Ray. Not medical X-Ray, but uh, automotive parts, aerospace parts, some medical parts for like Medtronics, heart valves. They all have to be X-Ray. We did really good growing Marietta X-Ray, but in 2008, we had another opportunity to enter into another market, which was Marietta non-destructive testing. So what we did from the very beginning is we tried to evolve with industry needs. I didn't say, well, okay, I started this company selling wrapper snappers, and by granny, I'm gonna sell wrapper snappers or nothing at all. No, we started looking for other markets to serve. And thank goodness for us, that market was the market and industry of non-destructive testing. So growing the business, just to show the numbers to you, 1991 total sales were $34,000, two part-time employees. 1993, we went to $280,000. We won our first significant Department of Energy contract. And how did we do that? I had a great relationship with Bob Wade at, at, uh, at the time, Trust Company Bank. And when eg and Rocky Flats came out to interview us, they said, Daryl, we think you can do it. You've got all the tools in place, but we don't think that, that you have enough financing. He said, this is the eg and Rocky Flats guy. He says, you go out and get yourself a line of credit for $50,000 and we will give you this order. $50,000, wow. So I called up Bob and I said, Mr. Wade, I've got this job, but they want me to have a $50,000 line of credit. And we just didn't have that kind of collateral. He said, well, let me do this. He said, let me write you a letter that says that Daryl Higginbotham of Higginbotham Associates has a line of credit specific for this job at eg and Rocky Flats and not put a number on it. And that letter got us that award. Without that letter, we would have not got that first big contract. But in turn, he set up a $10,000 line of credit that we could use. So know your bankers. 1999, when we did Marriott X-Ray, our total sales reached 1.9 million. We were growing very strong. 2008, we started Marietta non-destructive testing, entering into ultrasonic markets and eddy current markets. Our total sales were 7.4 million. And then 2009 hit. We lost 30% of our sales down to 5.2 million. 2009 was the toughest economic year we have ever had to navigate through. We had to cut our staff, we had to reduce the work hours, and we did that for about uh, six weeks on reduced work hours before the work started coming back. And thank goodness, in December of last year of 2009, work started coming back very, very strong. Until currently, we've got $10.4 million of work in progress. And we have the strongest backlog that we've ever in enjoyed. So what do we do? What do we do about our business? We design and build custom machines for all types of non-destructive applications. We go sit down with customers and they say, Daryl, you know, I'd love to have this machine. And we usually start with a whiteboard and start sketching and we come up with a concept. We have a 100% delivery rep record for every machine that we have been contracted to build since we've been in business. And that's a tough thing. That's a tough thing. Sometimes they're all not as profitable as others, but you've got to make your delivery to your customers. That's one of the things that I, that I think your generation needs to start looking at or, or understanding is we have evolved in, into a service-oriented country. You know, years ago, we built tangible things as Americans that people needed. We built goods. We need to find a way to get back to supplying goods instead of just services. And I think that's one of our advantages is there's not too many people out there building these machines. We have a sincere interest in our customer needs. You know, we're there to help them and to be an extension of their team. And God gave you two ears and one mouth. So the first thing you've got to do is you've got to go out and you've got to listen. You've got to listen and truly understand what these people are trying to do and why they need your help. If you don't understand, you're not going to be able to buy a piece of equipment to do a job for them. We are a responsive, proactive, and quick and move very, very quickly in the industry. And I think this truly gives us our competitive advantage. Big companies want to be able to move as fast as we do as a small company, but they can't. Sometimes we do compete against some of the bigger guys out there, like the Boeings and the GEs, but we can get a quote, turn a quote, and usually build a machine for the customer quicker than the big guys can get it through their legal team for approval. 
Here's this little snapshot. We have 51 employees. If you can see the chart, we have um, the one on the left. We have more tradespeople that work for us than we, than we do uh, degree uh, graduates. Welders, fabricators, assembly technicians, wiring technicians. They are really the heart of our business and put the machines together to make them work. Then we have college graduates, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, computer science. We have students that work with us while they're going to school as well, uh, intern with us, and then we have some office staff. A little flashcard of some of our install bases all over the U.S. We do have some equipment overseas as well, but we do work for Boeing and Lockheed and Vault Aircraft and Spirit Aerospace and Department of Energy, Department of Defense. There's a lot of things that, that we do out there, and it's really a different mix of different industries. All right, here is our manufacturing space, and it's, it's kind of hard to see in this photo, but we have three buildings, the 530 building, the 550 building, and the 470 building. And this interior shot is the 470 building where it's our heavy manufacturing space. We are the only ones in our industry that can conceive a project, do a concept for the customer, do concurrent design development with them to make sure we see the problem correctly, and then build a machine to solve their need, install it, service it, and support it. We are a cradle-to-grave company. Our three areas of focus is Marietta non-destructive testing, or X-ray, ultrasonic, and eddy current some of the bigger x-ray machines that we built before. The biggest robot we built was for Warner Robins Air Force Base. You back an F-15 in a hangar. This hangar is shielded with lead lining. And then we have a 50 foot by 50 foot robot that has an x-ray source and detector that scans all of the flight control surfaces of that aircraft and looks for cracks and water trapped in honeycomb. That's the biggest robot we built to date. Some of the other systems we built for Spirit Aerospace, this is a manipulator that scans new airplane wings as they're being manufactured. And then we also do x-ray systems for oil car tanks, for, uh, for rails. Ultrasonic systems, we have a number of machines we built from a small ultrasonic machine that does a very fine inspection of uh, chipsets for cell phones to larger tank systems that you put graphite composite panels in for like the new Boeing 787. And this is a large machine we have under construction right now that will do a whole section of a fuselage. That little ergo man there can kind of give you a sense of scale. It's 40 feet long and 18 feet wide. Eddy current testing machines. We've used a lot of different types of robotics. If we can buy a standard robot to put on a customer's application, we will. If not, we'll build it custom. This is a KUKA robot testing an engine air particulate separator for the Air Force. This machine right here is an eddy current machine. Anytime you change the tire on an aircraft, you have to inspect the wheel to make sure it doesn't have any cracks. So basically, you put the wheel on a big rotary table, it spins, and the probe comes in the side, and it does the test. And that's another uh, eddy current probe down there you can't see very well doing a piston test. Closing summary. All right, this is the brief download, the brain dump, I should say. Write your goals down. Put your goals on a piece of paper. Put it on your bathroom mirror. Put it in the rearview mirror of your car. But if there's something that you want to do and say, I want to start my own business, and here's how I'm going to do it, write your goals down. Write them down where you can see them every day and remind yourself. Work hard and get smart. Good quote by Gary Player, the harder you work, the luckier you will get. There's no substitute for hard work, dedicated commitment. And it's not going to be easy, and you're going to have your failures, and you're going to get your hands dirty, and you're going to have to borrow money. You're going to have to do all those hard things. You know, it took me years to get where we are now, and it took a lot of hard work. It also took taking some significant risks. Make your lifelong friends with small-town bankers. Uh, everyone in here, whether you start your own business or not, I know there's some big companies out there and big banks, but I personally enjoy small, local banking relationships. Associate yourself with the right people. Hang around with the right people, and they will pick you up and help you grow. And you can, in turn, help pick them up sometimes and help them grow. Get back to your community and help others meet their goals. I feel like just by talking with you a little bit, maybe I can give a little bit back to you and, and maybe give you an aha moment. Or, hey, if that redneck from Gainesville did it, I could do it too. Know your strengths and your weaknesses. Play to your strengths and correct or work around your weaknesses. For me, it was English. 
I absolutely hated anything to do with technical writing. But you know, the sick thing about it now is that's all I do is I write technical presentations to give to customers to go get bids. So I'm doing the one thing that I never, ever thought I'd be doing. Recruit and hire the right people to balance your company. Don't only bring in people that think the same way that you do. You've got to balance it across the board. Sometimes you need somebody to come in since there with, 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 with a kind of contradictory uh, uh, view of something that you think you're seeing right. So hire a good cross-section of different people who is going to give you that balance in your company. Learn from your successes and failures. Absolutely. You'll do something wrong, learn from it. I did something wrong not understanding the market for wrapper snappers. Yep, I learned from it and I moved forward. I do not have a rear view mirror. I am so forward focused. The rear is gone. What has happened has happened. Make a note of it so you don't do it again, but move forward. Support and serve your customers by anticipating their needs. Customers are everything. Without customers, you cannot have a business. You cannot have a business. And even if you don't go into business yourself, if you go to work for Delta Airlines helping to do uh, marketing to big football, baseball teams, you know, your customer is in-house. Your customer is your boss at Delta Airlines. You've got to have that relationship and anticipate their needs. So know your customers and know how you can, how you can help them out. And stay hungry. The competition never sleeps. You know, don't, don't sit back and say, I have made it. I don't have to get out and sell anymore. You got to keep going. You got to keep moving forward. And most importantly, balance your life. Family is truly more important than work. And I tell everybody that when I started the company, I started the company because I wanted to leave at 4.30 to go watch my son play t-ball. And that was true. And I still leave work today, or, or most days, by 5 or 5.30. My son now goes to Birmingham Southern. He's a senior, and he's playing baseball for Birmingham Southern. So he's still playing baseball, and I bug out of work early when I go over there and, and see him play their games. So balance your life. Don't go down that corporate word where you're just going to work your fanny off for somebody else. If you're working for yourself, it's a little different story, but balance your life. And never give up. Never give up. I love this. You know, who's going to give up first? Never give up. And with that, that is the conclusion of my talk. Let me start off with a question, then we'll turn it over to the students. Um, how do you transition from a guy who likes to machine things and invent things and build machines to actually running a small business? What, what <laughs> skills did you feel that you needed to pick up and how did you acquire those skills and the people to help you out? Originally, Alan, it, it went back to, to my previous employers and, and I really go all the way back to high school working for Fred Powell and Mark Bell. <clears throat> some, of the th some of the things that, that that they taught me early, st stuck with me early. And it's just something that I always knew and understood that I will have my own company or, or work in a small business because in my early days, that's who I worked for. Even Brinks was a separate subdivision of the Pittston Corporation. It was still a small group of 13 people. So it just felt right. So Starting it out, it, it, it was difficult. I spoke to a lot of friends. I joined the Rotary Club in Marietta. I, I got other business associates to share ideas with. And I started reading. And uh, one, of, one of the best books I think was influential for me years ago was a book that Jack Welch wrote called Get Better or Get Beaten. And it was 31, uh, I think 31 different secrets to success. And that book still sits behind my desk at the office and it has been marked in and, and it, it's still there. It is, it is my quick reference. Um, you mentioned several times about how um, your previous employers impacted where you are today and how you got there. What have you done to impact those who are working for you currently in order to impact where they Fan, go in the future? Fantastic question. Fantastic question. Since we have been in business, we have helped spin off four of my employees into businesses of their own. And sometimes, I guess on, on all, all three of them that are still in business now, 
we send work to them. But we still try to, to teach and mentor all of our employees to understand that they are a part of this corporation. All, all of our employees share in the profitability of the company at the end of the year. We have an open book policy where everybody can see how we are doing on all the jobs, whether we're profitable or not profitable, and where they are on labor hours. So it's an open book system. But at the same time, if somebody wants to stand up and open their own business, we try to help get them going and have successfully done. One, one gentleman had opened up his own business in South Georgia, ended up going to work for another company, but the three other businesses are still in business today. Um, well, what's your growth plan for the future? Are you planning on remaining a primarily US-based company or are you planning on expanding into foreign markets? I've been one to, to not assume that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. Our core focus has been here in the U.S. We do have a few machines overseas, but it's really U.S.-based companies that wanted to put them, put them over there. China right now is, is, is the, growing faster than, than is comfortably uh, comfortable for them, but we have an opportunity to do a few machines in China and, and, and have done a few, but it's not my core focus. We are fortunate to have so much work right now, and, and I don't want to over, overgrow our company. You know, at 50 employees, it's a very comfortable balance. I can leave and go home. We have a key management group in place that helps to run the company every, every day, but we don't really go out and intentionally seek the international business seg segment as, as, as a growth potential. We have so much growth potential just serving the industry here in the States right now that we're focusing on. Yeah, you said that um, you just went into Doris and knocked and like basically uh, asked them if you could do something for them. So what was your like sales pitch like during the first few months, I guess? Oh, as, as I was going out trying to find customers? Basically, it was from the heart. You know, we're a small business in Marietta and we have these machining capabilities. You know, we're looking for customers who need to have things made. You know, it could be milling or it could be turning or it could be welding or fabricating. You know, we were hungry. You know, give us, give us your work. And there was one point in time where, where, you know, I would go out the door and there'd be a couple guys in the back and I said, if anybody calls, tell them we'll do anything for money. But we don't do that anymore. Um, but we have had a, a, a number of things come to us uh, here recently that, that we don't take on. We're pretty fortunate to be able to pick and choose the kind of work we want to have. And, and now if it comes to us, we say, no, that's not really our core focus. You know, we, we really want to do other things. But you go out looking for anything in the beginning. We don't. Uh, back with the wrapper snapper days, I moved forward and I did get a patent on the wrapper snapper and it was very expensive. But we changed our philosophy to basically react quicker than anybody else can and get our product to the market it needs to before anybody else has a chance to come behind it. So, very seldom do we build multiple of the same kind of machines, but usually it's one-off machine. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you have three successful companies. Um, what do you think your biggest challenge in consolidating all three of them next year will be? And do you think that will affect your uh, departure time to see your son? That, 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 that's a, a very good question, consolidating the companies. And why are we consolidating the companies? For, for the bulk of the years we were in business, we had multiple sets of books, and employees would work on different projects, and we would kind of intermix them. We went through a Department of Defense audit last year. We did a big project for Homeland Security, and when we spread out all of our books on the tables and showed them what we were doing, the, the government auditors like, oh man, this is just so confusing. So that was our focus to consolidate the companies is, yes, we're serving different markets. Some of our automation customers are just going to have to get an invoice from MNDT, but we had to simplify it from an accounting standpoint. So we, we decided to, to do it this year, 2011, January 2011. Thank you. Don't, I don't mean for this to be a contentious question. But um, it seems like you have, you mentioned your friend who's now in the Senate. Um, as a small business owner, could you please share your, um, when I say political views, I don't necessarily mean Republican versus Democrat, but just generally speaking, uh, your views on the role that uh, government or politics, especially on a local or state level, ought to have. Um, 
Very, that, that's another good question. The role of government should be to give all of us as Americans and visitors to the United States the infrastructure that we need to exist. And we have to have government. There's no doubt about that. Uh, sometimes you can debate whether or not that, that they should or should not in, influence um, the economy by uh, some of the actions that they, that they take on the federal side, but, but that is out of my circle of influence. What I would like to see the government do, and, and this is something that has to be more than just the government, it has to be embraced by communities, is we as Americans need to instill um, in everyone that Johnny or Jane is not on the college track. And that's what's going on now is everybody, or the government believes that all schools and high schools, everybody should be on the college track. But Johnny and Jane aren't always college material. And there is just a core group of kids that are just falling away. They have nothing to do. They have the culinary arts that they call them, but there's not going to be enough jobs at McDonald's and Wendy's to hire these people. They need vocations. They need to learn how to turn wrenches on your cars. They need to learn how to make things out of metal. They need to learn how to build houses. They need to learn how to wire. So the vocational trades that we have embraced from World War II until the late 70s are gone. It used to be that, that you tell somebody you were a machinist, that was a wonderful vocation and they knew what it was. But I wish that, that somehow we can, from a government and a private standpoint, help reintroduce true vocational education back into the high school level and give these core group of kids something to do other than either go to college or work at Wendy's. So you founded the company and to grow the company was kind of the work of your life. So my question is, if someone made you an offer, would you sell the company? We have had two offers to buy the company since I've been in business. And they were both very large corporations. And I said no. Why did I say no? Yes, I could cash out and put enough money in the bank and not worry about anything for the rest of my life. But I'm not doing this just for financial gain. I get a lot of gratification of helping people, which is the employees, helping students, helping customers solve problems, for, for me, it, it's not, not just the dollars. And if I've looked at other small businesses like ours who have sold out to the big boys, there's a two or a three year track before they go away. They evaporate. The core people who run the company are gonna be the key management group. For example, and this is something I didn't hit on, the way we're structured is I started the business, but five years ago, I invited three gentlemen to be junior associates. Then, a few years later, they have become senior managers or senior associates. Last year, I introduced or introduced to the company or asked to join four new junior level associates. So it's like a pyramid. I'm here, three senior associates, four junior associates. So if I get hit by a bus, somebody's going to run that company. So my exit strategy right now would be to sell the company to the senior associates at some point in time. And what they do with it is up to them. But I'm not in it for the quick dollar. I've said no twice, and um, I would say no again. Thanks for uh, sharing your experience. Um, you mentioned that uh, that you know, over the years you become a more service-oriented country uh, from a manufacturing base. Um, as a budding entrepreneur, like you want to get into car business. Well, I, I, I think the, the question was, I don't think the microphone was, was, was turned on, but, but I had mentioned that, that we are thinking more service-oriented startups now in our industry, and there's not too many manufacturing startups going on. So as a young entrepreneur, uh, what would I suggest you focus or look at? So first thing I'll ask is, what's your hobbies? What do you enjoy doing?
computer industry, IT consultant. So you think in ones and zeros, and you like computer hardware. So that is a pretty saturated market right now. So there's a lot of people that are doing the same thing. But what can you come up with that's uniquely different than anybody else? What's going to set your company apart from the other guy down the street that's doing the same thing? So you've got to dig down deep and develop that. Sometimes it may not be a true difference, but maybe it's the way you sell it and convince your customers that, yes, you have a better solution than the other guy down the road. But manufacturing is, 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 is there again, since it's, it's kind of fallen off the radar a little bit, it's going to be even harder to pick back up. So uh, is there something on the hardware side that you can, can think and conceive of that, that may evolve or develop? But you just got to try. You know, don't just listen to me and I'm saying a service-oriented company is not the way to go. Show me wrong. Get out there and try it. You know, make it happen. And if it doesn't happen, have a plan B. What are you going to do if it doesn't? Okay, am I the last? Um, my you know, you're unusual as an entrepreneur in a, in a lot of ways. Um, one of which is that you actually make stuff versus uh, to create value. Uh, the other is, as we hear about entrepreneurial endeavors here, we always hear almost at the beginning of starting a company uh, about the exit plan. And so you're unusual in that you haven't talked about, you know, an exit plan, that there, ha there haven't been investors who need to have a uh, return on their investment. Uh, do you see yourself ever going public? Do you see yourself ever, um, you know, being uh, bought out, uh, you know, or do you see yourself uh, running this as a privately held uh, company for the long run? That, that is another good question, and, and we, we didn't talk much about that, but when I decided to start the business, and you saw the milling machine with my little son sitting beside me, um, I decided that, well, in order to do this, I have to have a machine to make parts. So I went out and borrowed $2,500 on a credit card and traded an old IBM XT computer for that milling machine. So that was my initial investment. And I had that credit card paid off within two months after having that machine. I've been fortunate because everything that we have done, we've grown internally. We, we haven't taken the big steps unless I knew it was justified and that I could pay for it. So we haven't gone out and sought capital from, from independent investors. Uh, there are good companies out there that do that, but I'll tell you right now, most of the people out there that want to come to you and say, I want to invest in your IT company. Let me give you $100,000. and Oh, by the way, just sign over that I have 60% control of your company. Don't get sucked in by that because there are some crooks out there. And there's a lot of crooks out there that make money on your sweat and blood. Avoid those people. If you need to borrow a little money, either do it internally yourself, go to your father-in-law and say, I need $10,000, do whatever you need to do. But, but venture capital, in my, my personal feeling, is a bad word. Now, as far as the exit strategy, I, I realized at some point in time that I will not be here forever. So that's when I started the associate program. And, and I'm hoping that at some point in time, we will sell out to the associates. So here's the tough question. Now I have a junior level associates. And by the way, I make the same annual salary as my three other senior associates. We all make the same annual salary. Now, if we have a profitable year, I will make a larger profit distribution than they do. But basically, we're all three compensated the same on a regular annual basis. So how will my junior level guys below me come up with the funds needed to buy the company when I am ready to hang up and go fly fishing? All right? If we're successful and the company is truly still doing strong and doing well, then that funding mechanism is going to be internal into the company. So we come up and say, okay, guys, I'm ready to go fly fishing. We're going to save the company, make annual payments to me X amount of dollars. But I will go a little bit one step further. I didn't just invest and grow the company. I decided earlier on that I was going to buy commercial properties. So all three of those buildings you see up there, I own. So if the business goes away for some reason, I can lease out those buildings and I, I could have income for the rest of my life. So at the same time growing the business, I added value by buying the commercial properties in a very good location that will retain their value for many years. Knock on wood if the economy doesn't go completely upside down. But I really don't have all the answers to the question yet. 
I did not start with the end in mind. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. Thanks for coming out today.